Uh, so we now have um, uh, Henry Wurzberg leading the discussion about our documentation. And um, so uh, this talk is, we, we, as I mentioned at the beginning of the um, beginning of the day today, we originally planned to have this as a small session sitting around a table where, um, you know, Bruno and Randy and Henry and myself and those that have been working closely with the documentation would um, uh, would uh, be basically discussing the, docu the, the documentation for a couple of hours. Um, I know that it's, documentation isn't everyone's cup of tea, so uh, feel free to sort of join in a bit later if you're not interested. This is going to be mostly open mic, so a lot of it's going to, we've got a presentation from Henry and then we're going to have um, some discussions Hello. on plans on the docs. <laughs> Raza! Uh, and please mute yourself if you're if you should not talking. All right. Somebody okay. Over to you, Henry. Okay. Somehow my screen got on here. Here we go. Everybody see that? Okay. Yes. Yes. So um, I joined the. Uh, effort on the wiki um, oh, about mid-year last year, driven primarily just for information purposes because I've been an advocate of Arctic Pilot back from APM one days, and it was real hard to get other people in the face of other autopilot firmware in the hobby segment interested because the documentation was really hard and extensive. And, um, Basically, they are had a hard time getting through it. So I got involved with the wiki stuff. In any case, so that's how I came to get involved with this. So, uh, oops, let me back up. I get the buttons right yet. Okay, so just some summaries of things that happened over the last year. Over 1,015 commits uh, to the wiki since last year. It's a lot of effort. And thanks to everybody that contributed uh, to that. Uh, we did and unified the structure of the wiki between the three primary vehicles so that the left-hand side menus and the way the documents flow are all consistent now between the vehicles. Doesn't matter whether you're in plane, copter, or rover. There's some differences, of course, between each vehicle type because some vehicles have different types of documents. But generally, the flow uh, goes uh, uh, along that way. And most importantly, if you go and follow through on any vehicle, the first time set up and the first flight, you're pretty much in the air. And that's pretty much all you have to go through for a basic vehicle. Uh, of course, there is advanced configuration uh, for new features, I mean, advanced features. Uh, but basically, if you can go through the first time set up and first flight, you've gotten all the basic information configured and knowledge to get the vehicle uh, moving. Um, there was a, a lot of cross-pollinization between the advanced configuration stuff and the peripheral hardware. That's now more clearly segregated where configuration is configuration, uh, parameters, configuring range finders. If you want to figure out what type of range finder, you go to peripheral hardware, which lists all the types of hardware. Most of the configuration is not in those pages, except where it pertains to something very specific to that piece of peripheral hardware. General advanced configuration for rangefinders is under the advanced configuration pages now. So that's all been segregated and, and organized uh, of those many subgroups. Uh, uh, and the subgroups themselves have been rearranged uh, a good deal from an organizational point of view. Uh, I understand it's a significant milestone, but the wiki was ready greater than 90% when 4.0 in the vehicles was rolled out. I believe historically that hadn't been the case. Yeah, that was great. Uh, the params throughout the wiki are now all hot linked. And <clears throat> that allows instant identification and notification of any outdated or erroneous params when a document gets submitted. 
uh, because it generates a build error. If the parameter doesn't exist for that vehicle, uh, it'll generate a build error, which instantly pops up when you build a local copy of the wiki. Speaking of which, there are over 750 build errors have been fixed. Um, and the outstanding PR list has been uh, cut down to about 10%. Uh, very importantly, Bruno did a lot of work and did parameter version. So now you can go back to Copter 3.6 on the params page. Um, let's see. Pardon me, navigating around here. Um, Okay, so for those who haven't seen it, little drop down box here gives all the parameters specific to oh, we're not whatever that version. At the moment, Henry, um, you need to stop the displaying of the slides. It's still showing only the slides window. You're not sharing the full screen. Oh, okay. So when I change my full screen, it doesn't follow. Okay, hold on. That's right. So yes. I stopped it. It's tied stopped to the screen. And then reshare. Yep. Uh, hold on. Uh, where is it? I think it's right here. Is that better? Much better. Okay. Thank you. So drop down. This is Bruno's work right here. So for any version in the parameters list, uh, you can get it specific for that version. Uh, so that was a huge step forward. Thank you very much. So now I get that was brilliant. Really, yeah. really appreciated the, the work that Bruno did. Now I have to stop and go back to here. Okay, I get back, get used to it. Um, okay. Um, so we're showing the slides now, right? No. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yep. So uh, recently, Peter B set up auto build of enumerated logger messages, and they have been incorporated into the wiki, and this can be extended to other things. Um, but the logger messages themselves, uh, it's just a first crack at some of the more important ones, uh, detailing all the details about each sub, sub uh, parameter value in the log message for a user trying to decode it off the side of mission planner or uh, droney or whatever as to what they really mean. We need help. We'll be talking about that. We'll be help needing help on trying to expand that. Uh, one of the things I do is every night I automatically build the uh, latest wiki uh, and check it for build errors, which may not appear in the wiki, but will highlight things such as missing parameters uh, or table errors or whatever. Uh, another accomplishment is a lot of the external dead links have been fixed in the wiki. Not all of them, but uh, a whole bunch. Uh, current projects uh, update the mission command list. Um, and we, I'm going to need help and we're hoping to get help from uh, people on that to check one, that they're accurate and two, that we're not missing anything. The intention after that is to split, we have a common page that has them all listed for all vehicles. And it's a fair, fairly complex uh, viewing system set up in the wiki. Uh, so only portions of it get displayed for whatever vehicle because uh, land commands are different from copter and, and uh, plane and uh, quad plane. So, um, but in any case, get that master document set up and then split it into the individual vehicles like Randy had already done for, uh, for the copter. Um, another project that uh, is ongoing right now is video additions to the dev. The environment set up uh, video, there is one that exists, it's out of date though. Um, using SIDL, there's a PR for that one. Oh wait a minute, I merged it. It's already in uh, the wiki at this point. Uh, and then using other physics model uh, simulators like Real Flight 
videos are real helpful uh, for newbies, especially somebody coming in like I did that hadn't used Linux and uh, was faced with a double whammy of trying to learn the operating system and its hints and tricks, and, as well as uh, learn the development environment, which was new. Uh, videos, I think, are very helpful uh, in that, uh, showing what you to expect uh, to see as you go through these things. Um, another project, there's a, a PRN now for tilt rotor mechanical setups, uh, maybe a video for that also. Um, and another project on the plate is update and reorganize uh, the, camera gim the camera gimbal uh, information into a cohesive and organized structure as well as updating as required. Well, that's what I have on uh, a list right now, as well as daily maintenance. Um, potential discussion topics I thought that we could talk about is how to get some help on uh, updating uh, the mission plans. From a wiki perspective, I can add words around anything pretty easily if I'm given some bullets. So uh, I know paperwork is uh, sometimes very distasteful to uh, the development process. But if you've got a neat feature that goes in the wiki or a neat function, it's neat only to you unless it can be shared with uh, other users. And that requires wiki documentation. So it's always uh, 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 sometimes a stasteful but important part of the process. For yes. example, the mission commands, um, uh, I need help on uh, getting that. And I'd like to set up a couple of teams, perhaps, to help on that. Uh, Tridge is, uh, and we all want to get the uh, copter tuning adapted into the quad plane tuning and sections in the wiki to help people uh, building quad planes on how to do the VTOL tuning. Um, Peter did a a great uh, job on starting the uh, metadata expansion for log messages in the code and we need assistance on further further that of important messages some of them i i think are a little bit too esoteric or out of date uh, but there are a, a whole lot i don't know peter can probably comment on how many are left uh, and again uh, assistance on anything on camera and gimbal Again, assistance doesn't necessarily mean that you have to write the wiki page, but uh, a note saying we need to do this, this, and this, and this is the parameter and what it means and stuff like that. And expansion can be done. Uh, I can do the expansion, the technical writing of the stuff in any case. And then it'd be always be helpful if we had a shot at the wiki page for any new feature or function that a code author gets merged at the time that gets merged into master because it needs to be in the wiki when it shows up in the beta uh, uh, releases. And then basically open the floor to any other discussion topics. So I thought it'd be useful to uh, start making some notes on ideas. There's quite a few of those discussion topics that I'd, I'd like to uh, I'd like to go into a bit more depth on. And uh, what I've, I've just created a little Google Doc here, which is that link gives everyone edit access. And I thought we could take some notes in there about uh, ideas on the documentation. Um, and uh, certainly with the, um, so I'm just gonna quad plane tuning. Um, there's aspects of quad plane tuning that are, at least the VTOL part, which is, uh, sorry, issue? Yes, uh, sorry. Uh, I have yeah, hi, Bruno. Uh, I have three bullets to insert in, in this discussion. Uh, yep. I'm very regret to discard you. Some months ago, I, I did an uh, opinion against the translation, but uh, I think we could uh, talk a little bit about translation, language translation for users that does not speak English. Uh, Concrete 5 
if we, we could kill it or not. And uh, when we put parameter versioning, I remember there are some arguments about put or not put a scripting uh, to do that or insert a versioning for the entire wiki. Uh, I think this is the three bullets that I have here. So I've just, in that document, we've just linked there, that Google Doc, I've yeah. started adding your points. So it'd be good now to sort of get some of these discussion points and go into them a bit more depth. So feel, feel free, anyone pop in there and start editing a little bit. I know it's going to be a little bit chaotic, but if you want yeah. to add points down the bottom to discuss on the docs, please add them to that doc, doc now. I find that you can't you edit have for reason. editing, mate. You can't edit there? No. No, I can't. Uh, I thought I gave everyone edit access. I'll just do it again. Get shareable link with anyone can edit. I'll just put it in again. It should be editable by anyone with that link. Is it not? Can anyone else try to edit? No, I can't. Ah, oh, that's odd. Because I've yeah, done it as in anyone can edit. Um, let me just... And I... I am not able to request to have a I believe text. you'll have to reshare it, Rich. Okay. Uh, well, I, all right. I might just save it again as a new, make a copy. Um, and then I'll do it again as a new one. It is, this is usually works. Uh, shareable link, anyone can edit. Copy that link. Try that one. How's that going? Can people edit in that one? Uh, nope. Yeah. Nope. Well, does somebody else want to make a copy of it and then make it editable? Obviously, maybe my browser is not doing the right thing. Or I might, I might do the whole thing in... Um, I'll do it in Chrome instead and see if it makes a difference. And uh, it's odd, it is set to anyone with the link can edit. So you should all be able to edit there. So there it is again. Anyone able to edit in that one? Yes. Hey, finally. finally. All right, oh. go for it. Okay, my apologies for that. I don't know why that wasn't working from Firefox. Okay, so uh, sort of jumping on, you know, the, the later one, the Concrete 5. The Concrete 5 has been a, a pain for a while. It's, it's difficult to update. Um, so we could sort of make a, a decision that, we, that we're just going to drop it and instead replace the front page with a wiki page. But there are some little features we've got on the Concrete 5 at the moment. So for those who don't know, the, the base ardupilot.org page, if you just go to ardupilot.org, you end up, that page is rendered using a system called Concrete 5. And um, then all of the links onto the docs are rendered using our wiki. Um, and we do, however, have a system on our front page which shows the latest blog posts. So. I don't know how we would do that within our wiki. So we, uh, we could just drop that feature so we no longer display the latest blog posts um, or we could just show a prominent button to display the blog. Uh, does anyone have any thoughts on that? How important that is on our main page? I think the issue that it's a, probably even a little bit more complicated than that, unfortunately. Um, so Sphinx itself, which is what the wiki uses, has limitations as does Concrete 5. So to we could replace Concrete 5 with a static generator out of GitHub like Hugo or, or there's a bunch of them um, to replace the Concrete 5 part of the Pilot website with something that comes out of GitHub is easier to maintain, is easier to, to control access to, um, more people can maintain it, that type of thing. Um, I think there's a number of people on this chat that have heard me whinge about Concrete 5 for years now. Um, yeah. But 
so we could still maintain two separate websites, if you like, the wiki still in, in Sphinx and replace the, the, the front-facing.org website with, with another static site generator, which we could put some of those features into um, that aren't easy to do in Sphinx. Um, but then you end up maintaining two separate websites out of, out of GitHub, um, which probably isn't the best long-term solution either. I mean, my preference would be to redo the wiki in Markdown rather than RST and then have um, a common static generator for both the main web page and the wiki. But it's a massive amount of work to do that. I mean, well, we looked at that I mean, you know, two years ago and it's, it is a it huge, is a amount, huge of work, amount of work. We can generate RST. I mean, we do generate RST for the parameters already. So I guess we could generate RST for that blog section on the front page, just like we do for the parameters. Um, yeah, the issue is that most of the static generators use Markdown, not RST. Um, so converting what we've got for Sphinx into another another format, because RST is you know a, a richer language than um, than Markdown, it does it's difficult to do the translation well without a lot of manual in, intervention. Um, so what I meant huge. was we make the wiki just point at a single wiki page, but we generate the front page. As a, as a generated RST page, much like we do the parameters. And that would, if we regenerated that every half an hour, we could allow for blog posts to appear on the front page. Yeah, okay. And that way it's all in the wiki, but there's just a, the same as the parameters. Um, we have just an extra dynamic page, which is our front page. Um, and that should allow us to use the same template and, um, and copy it in the same way. Um, I think that that would be achievable. And um, it does mean, I mean, the, the, the front page has got some other features as well. It's got sort of different diagrams. It's got those rotating images. We can, we can probably do the rotating images. Um, I mean, if necessary, we could use an animated GIF on that, but we may find we can actually do that a, a little bit better than that as using RST. So maybe we should aim for the whole thing to be just within RST, but but auto generate that front page, um, and that could be mocked up. We we could trial it as just a, a test page on the wiki, uh, and then don't go live with it as the front page until after it's all working nicely. Um, so that might be that might be a way to go. Um, I think, I think it's probably quite achievable. One of the issues, we've had a number of issues with concrete, I should probably tell people about. So uh, we're still getting warnings in concrete about HTTPS because we haven't managed to make it serve everything as HTTPS. So some browsers are still giving errors on the front page, um, which is really annoying. And I spent quite a long time trying to get that fixed up and it was just very, very difficult within concrete five to make it completely serve HTTPS. Whereas within the wiki, we, that was quite easy. Um, and, but the main problem is just the editing. It's um, because it tries to make everything WYSIWYG. If you, as long as you're doing something that fits within what the WYSIWYG can do, then great. But quite often we're trying to do something a little bit different and it's very difficult to achieve in Concrete 5. Um, we're, we're a lot more comfortable with check-ins with RST it also isn't easy to set up your own test bed. So you, with the RST, it's relatively easy to do a local build and see what it's going to look like before you push it live. With concrete, it's basically impossible. Um, so uh, that's a big disadvantage of the, the concrete five system. Uh, what about transform uh, the ardupilot.org slash ardupilot in the main page? and put the dynamic images, blocky stuffs just inside this. Yeah, I, I think we might create it as a um, front page, like a argypilot.org slash front page dot HTML to start with while, while we're developing it. And then we can just test that. And once we know that it's good, we can then make it live uh, and become the, the main link. Does that make it's sense? certainly be wonderful. Yeah, it'd be wonderful to get rid of the concrete part. Um, yeah, it's, it's a real, it's a real pain. Um, for me personally, you know, I just, yeah, I, I just, you know, I, it seems to be really challenging to just try and get rid of it. But if we can, that'd be great. Well, I, think I think we what can. We've been, what we've been doing is just sort of trying to 
cut it down to do as little as possible. Um, so you know, removing removing menus, moving them all into the wiki if possible. But yeah, no, I I think we should try and try and get rid of it over the next year. Um, and create a new front page HTML and then start playing with the dynamic capabilities of uh, generating stuff into RST. Um, that, that should be quite achievable. It'd be a good thing that we could go into the details of that maybe on our you know, fortnightly documentation calls as we, we try different experiments. All right, so does any, anyone want to speak up on behalf of Concrete 5 to say that they want to keep it? Before we go through another exercise of changing our wiki again, do, is, do we have actually compile the list of things we don't like about it? And then we could check those things off on whatever the next thing is that we choose? I don't think we're proposing to change the main wiki software, which is the vast majority of our pages. I think we, we discussed that just briefly and rejected it as being too big a change. But just the front no, that, page. That's, that not, what was, that's not what I was. That's not what I was suggestion I, I asked if we have compiled a list of issues with concrete five that we don't like or that are a problem that we want resolved with whatever system we're going to replace concrete five with just yeah just to make sure so, that we hit that list okay let's put it in we've got a section on concrete five uh difficult to edit can't do https properly so i'm just adding um, to answer Craig's question, uh, Yanni, Hamish, and I did go through that process about two years ago, um, but none of us had the time to have done a follow-up through, so we haven't. So nothing was acting from home. I could try to find that. It's probably a Google Doc somewhere. Um, we did evaluate probably five different frameworks for static to replace. Both at that stage, we we're looking at both the wiki and the um, concrete five pages with static with. Uh, github based static generator um and it basically became too hard and no one was willing to take the work on but the the background work for that will still exist somewhere um, i can dig it out if people need it yeah i mean the common thing we hit is we we want to make some small change to concrete five and then we all flounder about as we don't know how to make the change uh, it's just really we found it very difficult to use um uh, in think, practice I think the reality is Concrete 5 is designed for a user uh, with a different set of skills than us. It's not the, the nerd that likes to hack on things. It's actually got a, a user experience, but doesn't work well for power users in that case. I think we'd be better off with plain HTML, just a static page somewhere or other with some HTML and JavaScript and a little bit of backend, you know, uh, Ajaxy stuff to pull some API that gives us blog posts. Yeah, I mean, we can do that with the RST, just like we've done with the parameters, and we can embed arbitrary HTML and JavaScript inside the RST. Um, so that gives us the same little, um, allows us to have the same basic format, you know, the, the framing and things and the, the headers and footers. And so then... Just pushing, pushing as yeah. much as you can to the wiki, uh, and then when Concrete 5 becomes irrelevant, um, the front page gets replaced with a static page and we move on. Yeah, no, no, I agree. Yeah, no, that sounds like a, I, I think we should basically prototype that in a new, you know, front page RST file um, and start prototyping some of the dynamic things there, but not link it anywhere. And then as we, as we get it working well, once we decide it's good enough, we then just replace the front page um, in the Apache config to make it auto redirect to that front page. Um, and uh, and then if things go badly, we can switch back to the concrete, and we'll kill off concrete once we once we think it's stable enough. The new system. All right. So I think that gives us a bit of a plan uh, as to what we're going to do there. And um, so so there's a few other topics that uh, that Henry had in his list. Plus we've added to this documentation. I mean, a big one is translation, and that's something that's come up as a as an issue many times. So does anyone want to speak to that issue as to, you know, to advocate for a translation system or doing or not doing translation? So the, I mean, the obvious problem with the translation is the maintenance, is maintaining the translated wiki 
uh, it's it's quite a lot of work because there's an awful lot of text that um, needs to be done, and uh, keeping it up to date is a is a lot of work. My only exposure is that I know that there is a clone of the entire RG Pilot website in China that's in Chinese and managed by Chinese speakers that we have absolutely zero control over. Mm. Done there's three at least buzz of those um so there's one that one of our github users um uh stone white and it is the english name he uses he led a team that did that quite a few years ago plus hex have a limited chinese wiki plus cuav have a limited chinese wiki so there's at least three different versions of it out there yep. um that's unfortunate you know it, it would have been better if they were all on the archive pilot site so i you know Having the, the first language that we translate into being Chinese is probably the right step. Yeah, but yeah. exactly. How yeah. do we coordinate it and, um, and how do we keep it up to date? Um, it's, we, we would need, first of all, you know, somebody to be the, the point person in the team who's responsible for that, that translation. And Perhaps they would have... Could we contact the three previous Chinese translators who have gone off and made clones and asked them to, um, you know, lead the project. And how would we host it? Do we host a, like a mirror copy of the wiki or a subdirectories? We need sort of some technical support for it. For yeah, how we, so this comes down to the architecture that. of the wiki bridge. And this, uh, this was one of the key drivers when we went through this process with Diani and Hamish in 2018, was support for, for multi-language in the wiki. And most of the modern frameworks will enable that. So you can have it all within the one GitHub repo and it just serves a different version of the page depending on what region the user's in. Um, so, the, so systems exist to be able to do this. Um, we're not the only people trying to solve this problem. Um, so maybe we can try and keep the, the scope small. You know, um, Henry, I guess, has uh, you know, reworked the wiki so that we've got the you know, getting started area. It's, it's a lot. You know, maybe, maybe if we just focused on the what is it, first first time setup, like the maybe the hardware options, or just call it hardware options. You know, is pretty standard. You know, I mean, um, well, I'm sorry. Let, let me, uh, yeah, the, the, you know, the Artipilot hardware options, the intro and the first time setup. Maybe those sections, like configuration and you know calibration of accelerometers and stuff. That's probably the that's probably like the most popular part of the wiki. Maybe we could just keep the scope to that for now. It occurs to me that the system Bruno did for parameters is actually very close to what we need, where it, that gives you a drop down with different versions of different parameters. Now that's basically looking, that's using some JavaScript, which goes and checks for the existence of files for the translated for each page for the parameters. Now, if that, if that had a language drop down and the language drop down wouldn't appear at all if there's only one language available for a particular page but if the underscore cn file if we had the same file but underscore cn.rst existed then the, the drop down would appear and people would be able to then select the chinese version of the page by choosing the language drop down preferably with a flag probably like the british flag maybe and a, a chinese flag um, so that it's clearer um, uh, that would allow us to do it on a page by page basis. It'd be nice if it was sticky. So when people went between links, if they went to the next page that the link also went to the CN page, if it existed. Um, uh, Bruno, you got any comments on this as to whether that's achievable? Well, achievable yes. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's achievable. I'm afraid about two things: uh, the, the possible mess with several files with the same folders, or several folders inside the folders with different languages. And the the major afraid that I have is uh, about quality assurance. Uh, for example, if someone uh, writing in Greek or Portuguese. Uh, who will app app approve this PR? Yes, we would need we would someone that, have, yeah, someone who will at least at least read that uh, in order to to check is there is nothing offensive. Uh, I not mean uh, technically wrong or quality, but at least to 
make our bodies safe about uh, what people are writing and doing in PRs. Well, we'd need a language lead or one or more language leads who are authorised to approve commits to the language files. So there might be a couple of people who are trusted to approve commits to the Chinese pages and another couple of people who are approved on um, you know, Portuguese pages or whatever other languages turn up. But, um, and we'd have to, we could probably make it a rule that a commit can only be in one language. So you have to do it as a separate PR if you want to update the Chinese or the, the Japanese or the, you know, whatever it is for a page. But the commit could, a single PR could do 20 pages in the language. Uh, and then it has to be approved by the approved language person. We've got groups um, in, we could potentially even make it that you can only uh, merge commits. Um, so the, 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 the people that we trust for a particular language, we could make them part of the, the Chinese language group within GitHub. And, um, and they would be able to commit anything in, Chi in, in, the, um, in the Chinese language group. It could be done as a branch as well, because you can give particular users commit access on a particular branch. So we could have like the CN branch um, and instead, and that way the, the build process would have to, you know, check out each branch or it could be done as individual files. Um, individual files is easier because then all the images and things you can still embed, although we would like the, it'd be nice to have the possibility of embedding a Chinese version of the uh, mission planner image. You know, if the, the translators went to the trouble of recapturing the screens for things like screenshots of a ground station in with a Chinese language, it'd be, it'd be nice to be able to use those. So if we had this convention you know, underscore and then two language code, like underscore capital CN. Um, so let, let's start putting some notes in here for a proposal. Um, so I'm just going to um, translation system, just add some notes on, on this. And um, I'll put it back. Of, I'll just undo that there and then start some points underneath it and I'll make it just normal text and write um, use underscore cn dot rst for Chinese language files um, in general in use yeah that's right underscore cn dot uh, underscore xx dot um, for language xx for file type ext for the extension uh, allow for images to be translated. And it would be nice uh, actually if we could catch well. when, when we make a backward step. So you can imagine as part of restructuring or something, the you know the developer somebody goes in there, changes the English page, uh, doesn't update the Chinese page, but you know, somehow breaks the Chinese page. Um, some kind of automatic warning of that, like build yeah. errors would be nice. I mean, we and could do this by as a post-processing. I mean, if it's difficult to do inside Sphinx, um, we could potentially use a post-processing stage um, on, uh, on the HTML to go and add in the JavaScript and that sort of thing. Just depends how easy it is to, you know, to change Sphinx to do this, but I suspect we could um, do a Python script that does post-processing on the generated HTML uh, to add language links. So basically we'd run Sphinx and then we'd run a Python script over the whole of the generated HTML for each, each one we'd look, does the, is there a underscore CN and then automatically link it in um, and et cetera for the other languages. Does, it, does that make sense, Bruno? I'm not sure if I followed you, but I, I still have the, the concern that the, Rain said, the difference between the, 
when someone changed the English versions because we'll be more often than the Chinese, Portuguese and stuff like that. I, I, I we can post process and, and uh, raise some exception. Oh, this this file is too old, like, related from the original one, but uh, I will raise uh, it for. How do you handle parameters? Um, they parameters. They can't be linked like that. No, 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 no. The process is post process is not that hard. Uh, no, what I'm saying is, uh, are you going to? How, how do you handle the the parameters? In the China? parameters page, you mean, Henry, or you yeah. mean the parameter links? So the parameters when page link, when they get linked, and how do you change the links uh, appropriately? There's got to be a mechanism for translating those if you come across them. Well, the post-processing, I think in the post-processing, if they've selected a different language, we'd make the post-processing go to the translated page, including the translated parameter page, if available. The, par the parameters so, is tricky. Um, exactly. I actually posted that in the chat as well. Um, yeah. you, know, you could argue that the, you know, getting the parameters changed in the Chinese is, is just as important, but, um, uh, you know, maintaining that, because that's actually like in our, in the RGPilot code itself would be could be tricky, um, especially when you start having combinations of you know different vehicle types. So you can imagine, you know, right now we have you know like some parameters like there, you know, some values are valid only for plane, some are valid for copter. You know, if you want to get those all translated into Chinese, you're going to end up with a really long list. Um, we could potentially have a like a a. a JavaScript link that translates a, a single parameter using the Google Translate. Um, I don't know how useful that would be for the parameter text. Um, yeah, I think, I think but, you know raw Google Translate is going to be is going to be really weird, really rough. What, I think some people would rather just see the English. What's inadequate about Google Translate on all our web pages? Yes, uh, that's the point I'm really regretted. Less discussion about that. I, I, I told you that uh, the Google's translation was very bad for Portuguese when you use in the Argopilot website. But after that, I, I did some tests and they, it's not that bad anymore. It's, it's much better than I used to see. Hmm. It's not, okay. Maybe it's not good enough, but uh, it's not that bad. It's not that bad. Oh, the question is, it's not that bad. And uh, also, uh, as it is an automatic translation, people are expected to get some weird results. So instead of us trying to, to keep up to date, because then we have a complete mess of trees, of versions, of parameters, uh, everything. Uh, mixed up. So if we just have that small JavaScript uh, from Google to embed on the page that will automatically translate to a specific language, uh, case solved, at least uh, not ideally, but the possible and best uh, good enough. I think we could do the two shots. We can try, I, uh, I can try use something like Google we ask for someone who speaks Chinese and the other two languages. We can try through different languages uh, and check the quality. And also we can uh, do some tests like Trich is talking about. I'm very afraid about what uh, uh, Rain said because uh, nowadays, uh, do, do you notice the image folders? It's not the most organized place. There are some yeah. folders, sub folders for some things, not folders for other things. Uh, it, we don't have too many mages, but it's, it's not easy to find things there. Uh, imagine lots of languages, lot of people translate some images for this version, but then someone update mission planner or update something, another images. I'm very, I'm very, very afraid about the mess that it can uh, bring to the wiki. I'm not afraid about the work to make it happen. The, the, my major concern is that if you have a parallel, uh, uh, whatever you do automated is going to be just as good as Google, okay? And Google improves, so why, why do it? But if you have a separate team trying to translate... Uh, and it's problem. something that is quite easy to do to, to a small test. You just have to add that uh, small piece of code 
I agree. Uh, that Google provides and uh, just do a section of the wiki, uh, for instance, plane or, or copter or rover, and see how it goes. It's yeah, well, that wasn't... a plugin. I mean, people can try it without changing our wiki. You can translate yeah. pages in Chrome. You click on any page and say, translate this page. So, yeah. yeah. The, that too. The, the, the previous proposal of having a Chinese language team or a Spanish language team or whatever, uh, managing their, a section of translated wiki pages, the problem is, is when they go to go to do a, a commit, the, the technical uh, authoritative sources are on a hand, handful, and they're all English. Okay, so they would have to, in order to, for it to be accurate, they would double and treble Tridges and Randy's and whoever, Peter's and whoever's workload on trying to manage those PRs. Um, so that, that's one of the concerns I have. Yeah, I agree. And, and you know, you can definitely get false information or in, inaccurate information uh, popping up in the other languages. You know, the English can be totally perfect. And then, but the, you know, whatever the Japanese or Chinese, uh, you know, has inaccurate information, which is not good. I actually, I actually really like the idea of the, of the plugin, at least as a first step. In terms of, you know, bang for the buck, it's, it's, it sounds really good. Uh, to, um, enable, to enable the Google Translate on other, other browsers besides Chrome, right? Is that what we're talking about? I guess so. Yeah, just, you know, yeah. If, if there's a button on the top, you know, you know, automatically translate or something so that users don't have to go and install some plugin or something, then that, that could be nice for users. And I imagine that, um, you know, that a lot of users would end up sort of clicking back and forth. You know, even, even if your English is pretty good, it might, you might give the, you know, the, the Chinese uh, automatic translation a, a go. And then, you know, when it gets too weird, uh, you know, it might, it might give you most of what you need and then you get to a part where it, it just makes a total mess of it and you don't really understand what it's, what it's trying to tell you. And then you might go back to the English um, and, and read it there and, and, you know, sort of flicking back and forth between the two, you might get, get you know, understand what it's doing. And, and sorry, just one more point is I really like the idea of it, of the plugin working because, um, you know, Google Translate, as, as Bruno said, is getting better and it'll be even better in two years from now. Um, and we can just like do nothing and it'll, our translations will get better. Does Google Translate allow the website to provide hints? Um, like, is there any, you know, format where it goes and looks for a, a hints file, which says this is the ah. correct translation for this particular sentence? Um, and I mean, we could do that with JavaScript potentially. We could have, have the Google Translate page, but we could allow people to commit a hints file which would be global to the whole website and then the javascript would look up in the hints file and it would substitute matching pieces of text because that would just be a, a substitution using a bit of javascript so that would allow us to correct the google translate where it's wrong and add it to a hints file you could imagine like a, either a json format or just a two column uh you know replace this text with that text again you, that you, will you bring what the, I'm talking the... about, bruno uh, again, that will bring the, the issue of who is going to validate that. Sure, um, but it would be so. an authoritative, we could, we, it would mean that all pages would be available in Chinese, but then when the, the, the task for the translator is only to fix up the really bad mistakes, or he would basically be able to uh, cut and paste a sentence and say, that sentence is badly translated, um, and he'd add it to a file in the root of the tree which the JavaScript would access and then would do an, an on-the-fly replacement of that sentence in the page. That should be a relatively easy piece of JavaScript. But you know, um, doesn't, I wonder if Google Translate has that built in. I know at least when you use the, you know, you know the translate.google.com and you, you do a translation there, it says, you know, it has a little button to improve this translation. So, you know, it gives you something and then you can say, no, a better translation would have been this. And then that just goes off. Who knows where that goes, um, but maybe that's how part of how Google is getting better. And if that was the case, we don't need our hints file. We can just tell people to submit your stuff to Google, and hopefully it'll. The, there might the, be a the lag on that. 
Um, yeah. And also, by the way, actually, Google doesn't work in China, right? It's blocked in China. Uh, so I wonder if that's... If, if we, really could, we could probably run it through... If Google's blocked in China, um, we could potentially run it through Google Translate as part of the build process. And then if the file hasn't changed, so we, we could cache the translated file, uh, create the translated file, but enable, if we had that hints file, which has in mappings for particular sentences. So for example, replace the word arming with an appropriate word in Chinese, because the word arming has many different meanings in English. And I imagine Google Translate probably does a terrible job for the word arming. Um, and there's lots of other sort of, you know, technical words that we use within our community, um, which Google Translate would do a terrible job of, but we could have a hints file that does translate those correctly for different languages. And then it'd just be a piece of JavaScript that loads that and then substitutes across the whole page um, to fix it. That might give us a, a quick way to get, you know, the, 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 the correct terminology as used um, because it's those technical terms that these automatic translators tend to do really badly for. Does that make sense? Um, it makes it <laughs> does it look so 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 simple to choose just one option. Plus, just place something in the chat here. Uh, looks like it is Phoenix already has some uh, option to do backend processing using translation. Uh, we could do a shot because if Google is not working, Google Translator does not work in China. That's a problem. But everything from Google is blocked in China, or, or just any, some? Any of the Chinese like speakers that? that are on the call now yeah, know if Google was, Translate works? I thought Google had kind of come to an agreement there, so I think that at least some of the services now get through the Great Firewall of China. Yeah. Uh, Hon, do you know? I noticed you're on the call. So there's actually a website. Um, called, um, uh, sure, but even even Google Scholar seems to be blocked um, unless they are like on a university network or something. That's what I heard. What about the translate service? Can people just bring up the automatic translation? Um, I, is that available? Not, I'm not too sure. All right. Just put a, a link in. There's actually a this comparatech.com. Will let will let you put in a URL and see if it's blocked in China or not. But uh, even works or not, we need to check the website with the plugin because uh, depends how it works. Maybe block in different manner. Okay, so uh, translate.google.com appears to be accessible in Beijing, Shenzhen, a bunch of other places. Hmm. Okay. Well, we can validate that. I mean, um, we'll hopefully have some more Chinese speakers on later in the day. We might ask them about, about the situation with translation, but I quite like the idea of cached plus substitutions uh, for particularly for the key terms. And um, so, you know, even terms like battery and connector and cell and things like, you don't want the word cell to be translated into a jail cell. Um, we want to globally say that a cell in the RG pilot context, you know, is a battery cell. And so you can imagine having this hints file globally that just says, you know, use the following word. Um, and um, uh, you'd probably actually have to have the source word as the one that Translate normally brings it for, because what you do is you'd, you'd do a batch translation of the whole page and then we'd have to have a, a CN, you know, Chinese hints file, which just basically substitutes one Chinese word or one Chinese phrase for another. Um, uh, in the because you the thing you're actually substituting would be the Chinese translation, not the English, because otherwise you can't really align it. Um, so I just want to say though that if, if we're responsible for the substitution and stuff, you know, we won't. Um, you know, it can be it can be pretty complex. Of course, it might not just be a one word substitution. Like battery is probably is just going to be like yeah. You know, the word for battery is going to be replaced with another word. But you can you can imagine that sometimes you know nouns get turns into adjectives or something like that. Or 
or it has a sure. knock-on effect on the male-female, you know, French. Uh, you, could, you could do whole sentences. I mean, stuff. the hints file. The hint, you'd apply the, the the person who is responsible for the Chinese translation would be able to edit that hints file um, with whole sentences if they want to, um, and and so they can actually replace you know whole chunks of text, even paragraphs, if they really want to. We just need a, a markup format to allow them to put in um, the the original one that came out of the translation and and the one we actually want on the site. But it it would be a lot faster because they'd only have to do the ones that are really bad, uh, the ones that really need fixing, and it would mean that when the page is edited, if that paragraph didn't change, uh, or that sentence or that term didn't change, it would still get it correct. Um, so I think it could be quite a powerful technique. And then we, we basically batch translate to, to languages. We'd only bother having a language if we had somebody who put their hand up to say, I will be the volunteer to, to do this for the language. We won't suddenly offer 50 languages on the site. Um, we'd need a volunteer or it's just not worth doing. Somebody who checks that it actually works well. Okay, so Hans just checked, just in the chat there, Hans just checked with somebody in China, Google Translate cannot be used unless you use a VPN. Right, so that really pushes us towards the batch translation. And, um, and I'm presuming that Google Translate has an API where we can feed it pages and ask them to be translated. Um, I, you know, I don't know, but I presume it I'll does. I'll put a link to the API. I'll put a link to the API on the side chat there, Chich. Okay, great. Yeah, is it in the document we've got going there? Um, we should probably do it in because this doc, that chat is going to disappear eventually. But this document we can keep for later discussions in our um, in our normal documentation calls. You know, another thing, Trish, is I'm I'm just playing with um, uh, Chrome has an extension for Google Translate. I've been trying to translate pages here and there from uh, English to French, mm -hmm. and uh, I am not finding any errors so far. I mean, it's pretty good. Armed vehicle, it gets it right, you know, OS, batteries. I'm not saying it's going to be perfect, but it, it may be not as big of a deal as we think it is. Right, okay. Yeah, I, mean, I know there's a lot of effort gone into that in the last couple of years, so it's, it, uh, it could be good base. But still having those substitutions, if we could do that, would be very powerful for the mistakes that it does make. Um, it doesn't help with the images, of course. But um, if we just got the text and even if the images were wrong, that would still be a huge improvement. We, we shouldn't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. You know, to get something yep. useful at all would be, would be great. Yeah. Um, all right. So any, any last thoughts on translation? All right. So, um, I say one thing, Drew, sorry. That's right. um, particularly with the Chinese language effort, one of the challenges has been getting the manufacturers to work together on that. Um, in the, so unless we take it on at the high level within the project itself, which is what we're discussing now, which is good. Um, definitely where we fell over with, with the effort from the RDNI two years ago was, getting the you know the four or five chinese based manufacturers to actually agree to cooperate with each other um if we can solve that problem um having the the native speakers be intimately involved in that process would be a good thing but uh, we do need to manage the politics of, of competing businesses that's true i i think we could talk to them and it would be we wouldn't be so much interfacing to a, to a business as to an individual. Uh, it's the same with the dev team. I mean, you know, so it, it's, you know, Randy, who's a member of the dev team, not, you know, the company that he's doing some work for at the moment. Um, we'd build a relationship with individuals. Um, and I, I think it's worth a try. Um, and it doesn't even need to be any of the particular vendors. Um, it can be just, you know, a, a community volunteer who's willing to do that. Um, so. I also think that, yeah, relying on the automatic translation, you know, the Google Translate also gets around that problem a lot because, um, 
you know, it's, it's just a translation. It's not a complete, you know, rewrite of the, of the page or the paragraph. So I can imagine, you know, for example, you know, if you have a manufacturer, um, you know, obviously we love all of our manufacturers, et cetera, but, um, you know, there might be a tendency when they're, say they're rewriting like a, um, you know, section on the compass calibration and say, hey, uh, and this, this you know, added a little link there saying, in, you know, this compass works really well and a link to their site with, a, with a, um, you know, pointing, you know, linking to their store or something with their particular compass. Um, and I think, we, you know, if we rely on Google Translate, we can be, uh, you know, more confident that that kind of, you know, stuff doesn't, doesn't happen. Yeah, I, I think it's worth having a go um, and, and trying it. Um, and that so. at least is only one small piece of JavaScript doing both, uh, Google Translate on a page. So yeah, it's we a quite can... quite easy thing to do and fast. Yeah. Yep. Uh, although I think because it's not accessible in China, the cached copy of it could be quite important. That it'd be we probably worth to... running the test whether that maybe the JavaScript embedded API does work in China. Maybe it's just the main page that doesn't work. Um, yeah, I don't. I don't know. We'll have to have uh, to ask someone that is behind the the great firewall to test yeah. it. Yeah, we're, we're, we've got people that um, work with the dev team in China that we can ask to try these things. So uh, if we do the JavaScript one first and just see if it does work, and if it does, then then maybe that's a, a quick route in. Um, yeah. All right. Um, so uh, uh, so uh, sorry, uh, just to add, uh, uh, I I know that also being translate also has some kind of the same capability. Uh, as Google Translate, so it might be another option to try out if the Google Translate fails in China. Which one? That's which? Which is that? Bing Translate? Did you say which what was the other one? Yes, Bing Translate. Right. Okay. Yes, that's worth trying. Um, and there may be, in fact, Although, a, an equivalent translation service within China. Um, uh, yes. Does anyone sure do is. you know if there's an equivalent? Uh, equivalent to Google Translate that is available I, within China? I heard there is, but um, the quality is terrible compared to Google Translate. Um, right, okay. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. But yeah. my news is like a year old, so I'm not sure about now. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah the point about that, um, uh, the point about the YouTube videos not being accessible in, in China is, is totally true as well. That's all. Um, all of my videos are in on you know, YouTube, but uh, not accessible over there. Yeah, but changing Sorry. that and putting them on another site—that's a—that's a major pain. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, we could do it. We could host the video separately, but it would be. Yeah, I, I think that's a bridge too far for the moment. Yeah. Yep. I, I was all thinking right. about something for the translation stuff, where mm -hmm. um, for for this call at least, where um, if we had an, another. Uh, user kind of like there's a Tridge 2 on here that was somehow um, able to listen to audio and then do Google Translate just continuously and somehow someone could that, that would like post stuff so basically a bot in the zoom meeting I uh, yeah, that could be a plug -in that could be extremely could frustrating <laughs> I, I doubt it would work well okay I was just, just thinking yeah. Yeah, real time audio translation is quite difficult. It's coming along though, right? I mean, oh, yeah. Can't, can't In a few years, it question, but might be doable. Well, Skype has uh, it. No, no, sorry. Uh, the continuous translation uh, of Google Translate on the phone works wonderfully from German to English. I use it all the time. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. I've never tried it. Yeah, and I've done the uh, Skype translations on the fly with people and that actually works quite well. Hmm. Okay. All right. But I the did, main I thing is our, our wiki for really our, yeah. I, I don't think that helps with our wiki at the moment. Um, all right. So moving on from translation, uh, logger messages. Um, so I've just put in an example link to the new logger message system that, that Peter's done and is now been incorporated in the wiki with those, those log messages. And um, it really is brilliant that we've finally got 
documentation for uh, a large number of our log messages. Um, and uh, uh, Peter, do you want to talk about it at all, the sort of the limitations or next steps with that system? Uh, yeah, sure. It's um, the number of fields, uh, the number, amount of metadata, different amounts of metadata we actually you know, attach to our messages uh, quite limited at the moment. So um, we allow you to kind of attach a description of the message and then uh, for each of the fields in the message, you kind of provide a description. Um, I also kind of allow you to specify a URL where you might seek more information on how you might use the message in your, uh, to, um, uh, to diagnose the problems with your vehicle. Um, I think that's going to be one of the fundamental things, we'll, problems we'll find with this metadata is that it, at the end of the day, it may actually not be all that useful to people because it's the way you use the messages, which is more important. So, um, you know, if a user has a problem with their vehicle, um, sure, we can tell them what all the fields mean, but how you actually combine that information to you know, work out how, what the problem with the vehicle is, is uh, might be the tough part. Um, yeah, the other thing a couple uh, of tries at that. But, uh, sorry, go on, Peter. Um, so yeah, actually that at URL field might actually be one of the more useful things we can do. So somebody's trying to diagnose a problem with their vehicle, so they're flicking through all of the messages that we log, um, trying to find the information, they come across a likely message. If the URL uh, field, the URL field might point them to the solution to how to diagnose their vehicle. Well, actually, I think, you know, the thing we've got a little bit of it, but in the debugging the logs uh, documents, debugging using logs document, I think that's what needs to be expressed. Uh, if we could categorize the common problems that a user would have to go and use the data flash log and I'm just becoming reasonably acquainted with it um, into a couple of broad categories and then make some uh, detailed explanations like it's been done in the past in the wiki about what they are and what messages. Uh, where we started this was because all the logger messages that we did have documented in those sections were out of date and uh, incomplete. Uh, and this is a great tool for giving uh, the ability to read the roadmaps, uh, the sidebars, the mission planner and journey. Uh, and I think what's really necessary, if it's going to be useful to, to a inexperienced user, and I'm the classic inexperienced user for data log, data flash logs, is, um, uh, tutorials on how to solve, if you've got this class of problem, you've got this class of problem, these are the things you're going to go and look at, these sort of messages. Uh, like, for example, Trich has a, a fairly uh, straightforward uh, or, or has his own methodology where I'm going to look at this first, look at variances, look at this, look at this, look at this, look at that. If somehow we could distill that down into a couple of major categories and you guys get requests all the time for help in diagnosing users in problems, you're in the best position to categorize yeah. major broad groups and then propose, let's do uh, uh, a tutorial on this, so resolving this kind of problem, resolving this kind of problem, this kind of problem, and update what we already have with that. But the basic tool that you need to be able to do that is to be able to have those have <clears throat> what's involved in that those processes those logger messages explained so that it makes a little better makes a little better sense and you've already made the major step for for that peter so i okay, so sorry go on peter uh, so i was just going to say um the um henry asked earlier um you know what was the scope of the uh, remaining work on getting the messages logged so i've gone off and created an issue which i've tried to link in the uh, uh chat there and utterly failed it seems there we go 3900 maybe i did i did um so you know it, there's uh you know about 130 odd messages to uh yet to document uh which is a fairly stiff sort of a number um, things that I'd like to do in the future for this as well would, uh, would be to uh, include uh, the enumeration values. So a lot of the fields that we log, uh, the values in them 
uh, are either directly values from an enumeration or the values we log are um, values made up from a, bit, uh, a enumeration bit mask. Um, I think actually including that information in, uh, in, in here would, in the generate, in the things we generate from uh, this would be useful. So actually, I do have a pull request in place which attempts to add it, but um, how we actually um, specify the, the values in that enumeration is still a matter of some debate. Um, what I've got works, but could be considered fragile. And we either have something like what I've got, which automatically attempts to determine the values of the enumeration, which could be, could be fragile and could cause us um, got a kind of programming overhead trying to keep it still running, or we can do what we currently do for parameters where the enumeration values are spelt out um, as part of the metadata. And in that case, you've now got things that always get out of date. So, so uh, what we've got in, in there now uh, is a start. I actually promised um, this documentation stuff as a, uh, a, a, a last dev call. So I finally got around to it um, kind of uh, a little late in the piece, shall we say. So I'd like to show people something that they may not have seen before. I'll just, um, uh, let me see if I can find that window. I'll just share my, my desktop. Um, so this is back when we were first adding the graphs into MavProxy. We, we have these XML files, which Mission Planner can also read to some extent these XMLs. And this describes combinations of uh, things to graph. So basically it gives a graph expression. And there is actually a description field in the XML, which was supposed to describe how to use and interpret this graph. Um, so now not all, most of the graphs don't have that because I, I sort of started adding that as, a, as an idea. And, and the theory was that you brought up this graph in whatever tool you were using, log analysis tool, and then below the graph, it would have, it would be able to show the description of the graph to know how to interpret it. If we could actually get that implemented in Mission Planner as well and in others, and or if we could display it better in Mav Explorer, um, that would go a long way to solving the how to understand the graphs. Um, because we can update these descriptions to say, you know, what to do with the results. So it's not just a pretty picture, it actually, you know, how to interpret it. Um, That'd so, be good. Yeah, it is, in, it is in there for a few of the graphs. You can sort of see that for the, you know, plane pitch tuning, etc. But the vast majority of the graphs don't have that. And we can add it for some of the EKF ones and others, I think a description per graph would be very powerful. I've linked that in the chat as well to the XML. Um, and that XML definitely needs a refresh, particularly with the new instance numbers we've got. Uh, Peter's been working on improving the Mav Explorer and PyMav link to be able to cope with those instance numbers better. And I think that would yeah, make refresh a- refresh the XML at the same time. Yeah, so that should improve that things should a lot. Quicker. But then if we could have a bit of an effort to go through and add the descriptions into the XML and then update the tools to display them, I think that would be a, That'd be a huge help. Um, and, uh, and then I'd like to work with you, uh, Henry, on some wiki pages of walkthroughs of a typical log analysis, because I've got a particular process that I use to, to do log analysis. And I think it'd be nice to, to capture some of that into a wiki page to show people what the process is, um, particularly starting at the sensor level, moving up to the state estimation and then moving on to the controller. Um, uh, so we could, I could perhaps use some of your logs from your, um, your tilt rotor flights, Henry, as examples and go through them together. Uh, Cause it's good to have sort of example logs. Ah, it's now oh, snowy yeah. in Japan. Yeah, that's uh, Mount Fuji behind me and cherry blossoms. Excellent. So it's not on Very the nice. spring, but cherry blossoms. <laughs> it's cheesy picture, but. Tells Lovely. you where I am. Um, but uh, yeah, on the, um, I just post, posted a link there in the chat to uh, the page that I did many years ago for diagnosing problems for Copter. Um, and it's really out of date now. 
Um, but um, there's like, if you sort of you know, think about, you know, the log files you look at, you can probably come up with like five or six issues that are the most common. That's what I did when I wrote that page. Yeah. Um, and, you know, that captures, you know, 80% of what, you know, people are struggling with. Um, and just on a, on, a slightly, uh, on a different point, I guess, is that um, I'm still finding that people are using the automated analysis button uh, quite a bit in Mission Plan. And they, um, you know, when they're posting logs, they say, hey, well, you know, I also ran it through my auto analyzer and it came out with this stuff. And unfortunately, our auto analyzer is two versions out of date as well. So it comes up with all kinds of things which are, are really just red herrings. It sometimes works, but it's pretty out of date now. It has mission plan of updated that. Um, I don't know. Where's Michael? Yeah. Where's a Michael? long time. Uh, is uh, is Galvania is William Galvan around? Uh, William is have... online. He is. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, uh, William also is working with a very interesting uh, project to present logs and stuff like that. I think it would be handy. At least it helped me a lot. Sorry, William, to talk all about your project. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's shown it to really, me too. It's a very impressive piece of work. Yeah. It's very um, impressive. I, I really, really like it. Sorry, Give us a quick quick demo. I, I, exp I expose you. Sorry, William. <laughs> but I, I, it's, it's, right it's very nice. It's oh, very you nice. Want to, you can sh share your screen okay. and show us yeah. a, a quick demo. Okay. Uh, first, I'll show share the link with you in the chat and okay this t log viewer yep it oh. actually works with data flash i really need a better name yeah that's i'm open for ideas by the way uh -huh. um yeah. I'm, I'm anxious i, I right. use drony a lot and uh as i've been learning data flash logs and yours looks much better Hangs up a little bit occasionally, but yeah. Okay, um, can can you see my screen? Really good. Yep, we can see your screen. I have a basic sample here. So uh, I was working with uh, Quad Plane some time ago, and it was really annoying for to understand what was going on, what was wrong. So I started working on this tool. I don't think it's quite ready yet but people can start testing and playing with it. Uh, it actually has two things. I started working on the XMLs. So you have some, some of the XMLs working here too. I started, I implemented some of the Mav extra functions. And I think the, the best feature is that you can, the things are actually synced. So you can, for example, load into uh, zoom in into this part of the graph and see what was going on with, with, with the plane and what That's was happening really with nice. each of the plots. I what love it. It's really nice that you can the... do it with different scales. Uh, you can yeah. have vastly different yes. parameters and they're just, it's just fantastic where you can have them all on one graph and you have RC channels on one and you can have little value to attitude uh, error. Uh, yes, it's, it's wonderful. I think it's, it's for, for me, it's more useful than things that I used to use. Maybe the messages that uh, Trish just said, this is inside the, the graphs of Mavi Proxy. If you could insert something like that together, I think it's, it's something very nice to use. For, <clears throat> for me, learning how to analyze logs for the first time and try to discover problems, I could never get hooked into uh, not being a, LAN, uh, a Linux native into uh, Mavic Explorer the way uh, you guys can. Went to Droney and I use it almost exclusively. And this is like Droney on super steroids. It's just amazing. Yeah, uh, I'm really open to any suggestions you, you guys might have. There are also some other features hidden here. Like the messages are also synced with the current flight position. Uh, so yeah, the messages the, should have a timestamp on it. Yes, that's right. Uh, Reed already told me that. So there's some other features like the radio six parameters. And I'm adding more stuff with time. 
but I'm really open to any suggestions you guys might have, uh, even a new name. <laughs> Yeah, and this is all open source. That one of the biggest problems with plot.dron.de, they they did, I think, a, the base job was was good, but uh, we couldn't improve it. We couldn't add new features ourselves, and we were reliant on sort of asking, could we please add that? And I think this one um, is already, you know, in many ways much better than the plot.dron.de one, but it. Um, because the source code is available, we're going to start getting community contributions to improve it, which is just brilliant. And it's all client side. It's, I've always wanted web-based client side log analysis so that it, we don't have to have a massively powerful server as it scales up. Um, all of the log processing, the parsing, et cetera, is done in JavaScript in the browser, uh, which means it's actually very, very lightweight to serve this off a server. Um, yeah, very so I was incredibly impressed by by this piece of work. It's not incredibly light on the browser, but on the server it is. <laughs> yeah, that's right. The main thing is to make it light on the server because um, uh, you know, yes, it, it obviously requires a a fair bit of memory and things in the browser. Uh, but most people have got laptops with a lot of RAM and and a you know large web pages are now pretty common. Uh, I don't think yeah, that's a major issue. That bad. Obviously, on mobile platforms, it might not work as well. Yeah. So, Is thank you very much for showing us. That's a really for your warning about this demo. <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. a quick one. Is there an option to share a link? Because um, that's one of the strengths with Journey is that users can upload their log and uh, do it all in the browser if they want to or, or upload it. That's in my roadmap. I actually have it working already, but I disabled it because... I had some other issues. Fair enough. Oh, you can also select the which source you want for the trajectory information. Can I ask you to drop a link to the source code? Just so uh, we know where it is. Oh, so I don't have a... Yes, make, it, make it better we are with you. Yeah, there's an issue. I, I, need, I should have a GitHub button here. Sorry for putting you on the spot with this. Um, yeah, that's fine. Yeah. And if you'd my like bad, to have a longer presentation bad, about this, we, we do have some spare slots. We could, you could show it off some more later, but yeah, I think this has massive potential. Do you, do you think adding in those descriptions of the graphs would be reasonable yes. to be able to pop them up? Um, yeah, I think that's really good. Uh, actually, I think they should be here somewhere. They yeah, well, well I was thinking more, it could be like a little text balloon thing, you know, like on comics, you have a, a button, maybe a question mark or show description in the top right corner of the graph and you click on it and it gets the description, something like that. Um, yeah, that could work too. And, uh, and that way, then we just need an easy way for people to contribute back a description and contribute graphs. Um, um, this, and, this presets are already using the, your XML. Yes, but if we need, people can then create new graphs using your system and then they should be able to submit the graph along with the description oh, to be included okay. in the standard. See what I mean? Yes, Where but... we have like a submission process. Um, and so when, because uh, we've got the save graph method, people don't need to edit the XML and Map Explorer. They can just create a new graph and then go save and it pops up a dialogue where they can type in the description. Um, yes, but... Similarly here, we could have a little dialogue box where you say, you know, submit, and it would, it could either email it or it could submit it to a web form or something, and then we'd have to approve them. Um, somebody would then approve the new graphs to get added to the central repository. Yes, that sounds good. I already have a backend, so I just have to implement some other stuff in there. My idea is yeah. to have a share button here. The, this button will share the log and the current uh, state of the viewer with the current yep. open plot and 3D view. I have, right, actually yes. I have a, I have another question that I was thinking about lately, mm -hmm. uh, about the overall layout. One thing that you, meant, you mentioned you missed was having multiple, uh, multiple plots like subplots. Yes, uh, that's I, right. I it's really handy having multiple plots and having them synchronized on the time axis. Yes. Uh, I was wondering about having the 3D view uh, smaller on the corner, like right here, and then a scrollable list of 
What? Oh yeah, you, you could put uh, it on. Yeah, you often want to show two graphs at once. Sorry, Henry. No, I think he's talking about right now. There's this this uh, graph on the top, 3D view on the bottom, and he's talking about boxing boxing the window of the 3D view into a little square on the side, so you can get more graph view. Yes, and then you can actually scroll the area with the multiple plots. Yeah, I think the 3D the 3D view is very nice, but the, in most cases, I'd prefer to have the top down satellite type view uh, oh, and have that as a sort of the default. Yeah, uh, flat Earth. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's more useful in most cases. There's only some situations where you really need the Z. Yeah, I think and more, more the of the area is devoted to small. graph. Yeah, so this yeah, could be right. just be a square here in the corner. Quite a small map. I could get yeah, it I here so. or something. Kind of um, like what you do with Siddle. You take the map and minimize it off to the side as a little square. Yep. Yeah. If graphs, I had proper uh, windows, that would most be of the screen should be graphs. Yeah. Uh, I guess you could use frames, you know, the those old evil frames. frames. Yeah, I don't know. I have to no, I don't know. Play out uh, a little. But brilliant work. Yeah, I'm just trying oh, to. Oh, it use really is. It's absolutely fantastic. Nice uh, thing uh, for my okay, uh, you need a re repository. Where is Zoom? I need to stop sharing. Uh, this is the link for so, the repository. Yeah, yes. Uh, sorry to bring the subject in the middle of the discussion. But uh, I, I think this tool is, is a very nice new start to present a how to interpretation log for users in the wiki. Maybe it could be a new standard. I don't know. Yeah. So uh, you, you, something I have on my roadmap is to have a and the interface itself, some a guide on how to use it. Like those websites that have some tutorials which show me how to operate. Well, personally, if, if you get the tool finished and polished off a little bit more, I'll be happy if we agree to put a wiki page about it in our wiki. Cool. That'll be nice. Uh, you're not, you're, uh, unmute, Tridge. You have to unmute. There you go. Yes, I think we can call it something like Ardu Log Viewer or something like that instead of T Log Viewer. I just need um, a name, yeah. Yeah. But it yeah, unless somebody else. Has I actually a, have some support for uh, PX4 too. Right. So okay. Ardu on the name is. Is there? Do you might have any issue with references referencing that tool off the wiki page? No, no, it'd be fantastic. Once once William's happy to right. do that, I mean, if, if he's still under early development right. stage and doesn't want it used yet, then um, uh, one, once he's happy with that, I think it'd be fantastic to reference it. Okay. APM log viewer could be a good option. Really good. Well, thank you so much for, for showing that at the very short notice, William. That's, that's great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I, was, I was just being shy. Right. I, actually, this was the right time. Excellent. Thank you. So uh, feel free to test it and I'm open for suggestions. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, now, what other things do we want to discuss in the sort of, we've got a list of topics for documentation. There's a number that we haven't gone through yet. Um, so mission command updates, I think improving our documentation for mission commands would be, would be really good. Um, what I'd really like to see is a little example for how to use a particular, particularly for the more obscure ones, um, you know, example in a mission that people could run, run in SIDL. Um, but, um, e you know, just documenting all the fields would be good. What do we have at the moment? Where's our page at the moment on that tries to document our, our mission fields? Uh, the name of it's common under common, it's uh, something like uh, Mavlink commands. 
you know, look it up. Let's Hold have on. a look under mission. Is it under the appendix or is it under our oh, mission planning? There it is. No, it's under mission, mission planning. planning, mission command list. Okay, here it is. Uh, so I'm, I'm guessing this is the page. Is that the page that you, you yeah. mean there? Com common nav link mission command messages. There. That's the one. Mission command. Yeah. Yes. That's okay. That's the one that has it all aggregated. You'll only see the ones for your vehicle when you're on in that vehicle section. Um, right. And just need some help making sure that because they're spread spread through the code in two two different places, I think. Um, yep. And I'm not, I don't want to be tech, try to be technically a student enough to do that. If I could get somebody a little bit better at it and tell me what needs to be changed, what needs to be added uh, for the three vehicles, I'll do it. And then split them off into each vehicle instead of having one big ginormous common page. Yeah, though there's a lot in common, of course. Most of our mission commands apply to multiple vehicles. Right. But a lot of those common, their common commands have different fields. Mm. Yeah. This is actually in pretty good shape, I think. Uh, we, it'd be good to you know, take some time to go through each one and, and validate it. But um, the actual layout is, is really nice. Um, yeah, the, um, just on the layout, the one um, uh, like from about 30% of the page down, I think it's really, really good. Um, the top part, uh, the top, you know, you have to go through about three or four pages at the top before you start getting to the, um, you know, the, you know, the specifics of a particular command. Um, I think we should shorten that top bit. I think it's a lot, too much information, uh, too much detailed information at the very top when a user probably just wants to get to particular command. You, you It'd be nice the, in the you mission the copter, If you have a look at the copter, the like manually created, I mean, it's all manually created perhaps, but um, the existing copter list uh, has, you know, just a little bit of discussion at the top and then it's immediately into the commands. So I think that helped users get to the information quicker. Yeah. The, um, or, well, the other way to do that is to have this as kind of a landing page and then three vehicle pages attached table of contents at the bottom. So this is the general stuff about what's the difference between a nav and a conditional and a do command. And then you jump into the specifics for each vehicle with three or four in a given vehicles wiki then a, pay, a separate page with just the command structures on it. But that's an organization thing that's, that's yeah. pretty straightforward. Yeah. The content is what I'm more concerned about. We can organize easily after that. Something I think we should add to this page is um, the size or, um, of the fields. So for example, you know, if it's a, an int eight um, in the, the Mavlink packet, um, so that users know um, what size of values they should be entering. Um, the, the reason I say this is um, I recently came across a user that was uh, sort of uh, trying to set a, an altitude in the uh, the takeoff packet um, as a uh, decimal value, um, and you know the, the packet itself is only an integer, and so that he's trying to achieve a really small takeoff value, um, and it's um, always rounding, so it's. Um, uh, wasn't actually um, it, it, it wasn't useful, so I think we should add something like that in there. Um, I and there are pros and cons to that. That's more of a dev thing, in my opinion. Um, as a user, general user will go and pop up a mission planner or QCG, and they'll find a do do jump command in the drop down list, and have no information about what they should be entering into those GCC ground control stations for those fields and what they do. Whereas I'm a little concerned that if you start adding 
all the bit links and stuff like that, an end user will think, what if I got to, what if I got to do with that uh, when I go to use it in the, in the ground control station? Uh, I don't see anything about uh, that particular, or why does that apply to me, you know? So kind of a KISS type thing. But in a dev document, that might be more interesting. I don't know. I mean, perhaps not going down to the uh, the size of the data fields, but um, I don't know. Just just giving some indication as to kind of um, what the what the increment of the value can be. Um, just to change the language around it so that it's a little bit more intuitive for users to um, uh, to come across. Because, like I say, I, I've I have come across users that are running into into this problem. Well, I I agree that the field explanation the description of it certainly could include units and most of them do um, or further or they could be expanded where they where they that isn't sufficient to tell somebody what it is uh, certainly that I believe would be worthwhile but if you look through them most of them have the values or the units uh, already specified in them and if they don't we can add them certainly I'd like to link in our mission editors in the various ground stations, have links into the wiki so that you can actually, you know, launch a, launch a browser so that when you're looking at something like the VTOL takeoff, you could sort of click a link and it'll launch the, the pane in your, you know, the tab in your browser to take you to that documentation. Yeah, uh, I think that'd be really powerful. Um, that would require support. We, we sort of needs two things to do that. One is we need to make sure that the wiki link is a very predictable URL so that we can take the name of the mission item. Um, and they, it looks like they are fairly predictable already. I think that the way you've put it together, Henry, it looks like the URL is probably could be machine generated. Uh, because it just goes, it's a hash followed by a lowercase version with underscores replaced by dashes. That seems to be the, the convention that's being used, which is fine as a convention. Um, and then we could sort of have a, uh, you could imagine if, if I share my screen here now and uh, mission editor, uh, there's my, my mission editor sharing. You could imagine in the right hand side here having a little help column and being able to click the help that is relevant for each one and it would then you know launch the system browser to take you to that to that page uh lining up with the particular particular one um because it's often yeah. while you're actually editing these things that you need to understand how to do it and it can be then difficult to find the right the right section on the page I found that several times in using uh, the ground control station on a phone where I've had to stop and go and uh, pop open a browser and go to the wiki, find out what I'm supposed to enter into it. For example, uh, I want to change my pit tuning value for my transmitter tuning from roll to pitch. and I have to go to the web browser and look up uh, the tune section to yeah. find that it's 50, 54 instead of 50. So those sorts of things could be handy, I believe. But that's not a mission one, that's a parameter. And that should already be showing up in the list with parameters. The parameter editors are supposed to pull that in already. Uh, well, um, this, the QCD doesn't. Uh, in any case, uh, Mission Planner probably does, and I didn't see it. But yeah, it was a similar sort of thing, so that the information is available somehow without having to go and open the browser. Yeah, so that one does show up. If I just share my screen again now and parameter editor share, then you can see here, there's the tune one for Copter. If I do that, you can see there's the tuning thing that you're selecting. You know, and, um, and so that proxy. is, yeah. yeah, that is showing up appropriate. There's some proxy does that. I'm pretty sure Mission Planner will do that as well. So I'm I think, pretty sure Mission Planner does that at QCG. Yeah. 
doesn't. Did so. you see? But that's something that we could talk to Don about to improve. He, maybe he just doesn't support really long lists of. Um, well, of it's kind of, it's kind of strange. He does some, and he does and others. He doesn't. There may uh, be a limit in the the height because notice this is a very very tall dialog box. Um, there may be some limit in the in the widgets he's using as to how many elements you can actually have. Could be. But in any case, that's a diversion. The, the original point you're trying to make was that it'd be handy to be able to find out details about mission items without having to open the browser. Window, yeah. Without yeah. separately having to open the browser. Window. Yeah. I mean, we can, the, the general description of each of these is available in the Mavlink XML. Um, and it potentially could just display the contents of that Mavlink XML, which we could then update to sort of improve it over time. Um, so that's a, that'd be an easier way forward. Um, so, um, and, you know, potentially that Mavlink XML could actually have a URL. Um, so I think, um, Maybe the, the first thing we should do is make it the Mavlink XML description to start with and start improving that description. Um, and, uh, and then later, we could even potentially have URLs in there. It's, it's slightly awkward with the sharing the XML with other projects and those other projects won't want a URL pointing into the ArduPilot uh, wiki. Uh, so, Got to work out some way to do that. Um, yeah, maybe it's a side point, but we we actually don't um, we don't actually tell the ground stations which um, you know, commands we support. So, for example, um, uh, Mav Proxy I noticed prevent, presents a full list of all the possible commands yep. that they yep. might, might support, but you know it's a fraction of those uh, that we actually support. That's true. Um, yeah, because some of them just are not relevant. There's no point in a, in a, yeah. in a rover implementing a VTOL, uh, you know, takeoff or something. Um, so with the, with Mission Planner, you know, normally what I do when we add Roll support for you, yeah, <laughs> with Mission Planner, you know, normally what I do is after I add a, you know, after a new command goes into a rover or something, I, I put an issue on the Mission Planner's issues list to add, to add it to the dropdown. But of course, it's non-version specific. Um, it is vehicle specific, vehicle type specific, but you know, if we're, I was just thinking that if we're going to create, at some point, if we're going to create, you know, an XML file or something with some extra information around uh, the mission commands, um, you know, the, the ground stations could also use that to automatically update the drop down list of, you know, you know um, of, of commands that we support. Yeah. Um, all right. So, but I think a starting point is just using the XML descriptions in those mission editors. And we, we just need to, probably open an issue for mission plan and see if we can do that. And then also uh, Peter or I could add that into math proxy. Um, and um, so that those descriptions are there probably as a little pop up, you know, hover, hover the mouse over the item to pop up the, the text describing it, something like that might be use, usable uh, or a clicker, click a link to pop up a, a little bit of text. Um, I think that's, Probably some sort of UI like that would make sense. Okay, so is there anything else on mission commands we want to discuss more before we we move on? Okay, so uh, quad plane tuning that you you uh, you mentioned earlier, Henry. Uh, basically, the quad plane tuning is way behind compared to the copter tuning, and I've just got to spend some time with you to translate across that copter tuning page that Leonard and Randy put so much effort into. Um, so I'm referring to this, let me just find the page now. Uh, tuning process instructions, in particular instructions about things like the, the battery voltage min max and the mod thrust expo and all of those. So that that's the page there I've put into the chat. And we don't have all, most of that information is relevant for quad planes, um, but 
it's not linked. If you're going through a quadplane setup, people just don't know how to, don't know that they need to set these things. And so we, uh, it's a bit of a tricky one because of the Q underscore M instead of, you know, MOT underscore that sort of thing, which means the best way I can think at the moment is we, we manually copy this across um, and then tra and then change it. I, I just can't think of a better approach at the moment unless somebody else has got one. Yeah, it's, e it's easy. It's, it's straightforward. If all of this is applicable, that's the question. Nearly all of it is, I think. Um, some of the numbers, I mean, you, you would generally set lower acceleration values for a quad plane than you would for the equivalently sized propeller on a multi-rotor, just because of the inertia of the vehicle itself. You don't want to be trying to do such fast roll and pitch in your accelerations. So people quite often end up with, I mean, the rule of thumb would be that your, your, your acceleration limits in a quad plane might be half to a third of the equivalent of the vehicle with the same size propellers in a multi-rotor. Um, just because that extra, the massive inertia of the wings. Um, and so we just change those recommended numbers. So I'm referring to uh, I'll just share my screen again. And um, so you can see here this, uh, these Excel Max, Excel P Max, Excel R Max, those ones. Um, I would sort of divide those by two or maybe three for the recommendations for quad planes. Don't we already um, have defaults for them? I'm sorry? Don't, don't we already change the defaults for them in quad plane? Uh, I think we do um let's see whether we actually do change those defaults and um and then we just need to figure out what the defaults are targeted for <laughs> yeah i don't think we do actually change those defaults but yeah so but i think in the documentation when we're going through this we, we will be adjusting some of these some of these recommended values for different size propellers um, and just reducing them. Um, I can get it all set up and we can just spend a half hour and do that. Yeah. 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 Uh, and there's, there's some improvements we need. The, um, uh, the, this whole thing with the Mott Frost hover and sorry, the, and the Expo, uh, I went through the Expo page recently with a couple of partners and they found it difficult to do. So I've created a, uh, a sheet for doing that. Um, where's that thrust, motor thrust scaling uh, That's very sheet. in the plane helicopter. Really cool. Oh, great, you've already done that. Great. I already okay. did it. Yes, okay, thanks very much. Uh, you're very quick. I only created the issue for that, what, yesterday. So <laughs> that's, yeah. you're amazingly fast, really, I mean, uh, Huge thank you, Henry, for the enormous amount of work you've put in. You've, you've completely yeah. revolutionized the documentation for Ardu Pilot over the last year. It's yeah, amazing it's the amount of work you've done. Um, so massive appreciation from the whole team. It's been, it's been fantastic. So yeah, I'll, put, I'll, I'll transfer the tune, tune over, get all the params renamed, and then we can sit down and go through the draft and change the uh, recommendation values whatever you think is appropriate and yeah anything else that we need to do on that what what about uh our marvelous new filters definitely we should be linking in the filters stuff that's fairly fast moving um luckily we've now got the harmonic and the plane notch filter available there is some additional notes people should have for quad planes because you often want to set up two filters one for the vertical motors one for the forward motor uh, and I found using the notch filter for one of them, the harmonic notch for the other worked really well. Uh, and that obviously doesn't it, apply to a multi-rotor. Didn't Andy almost through making it to where we don't have to adjust anything? <laughs> with, the FF, with the real-time FFT, yeah. That one's only in master. It's not in the stable releases yet. Um, and I think that it is a fantastic feature and I think it's going to become probably our recommended way in the future. Um, but, uh, for now, if that's a, you know, in the experimental or sort of, you know, alpha test stage, it's not, it's not available for general users just yet. Where is he on the work curve on that? 
how much uh, through. Sorry, how much of it is is merged? When is it ready to be completely? When is it ready to be documented? Is my, my question. Uh, um, because I prefer to document something as soon as we get it in you know, a basic thing like that. As soon as we start to get it in master, so that we can massage it as it's getting tweaked, ready for the rollout in the wiki at the beta phase. And that, that's actually really good if, if doing that almost in real time while the developer is doing it, like making a requirement for before the PR goes in or something, having some basic structure in the wiki. Yeah, that's my point because uh, it's less likely to be forgotten, the details. Yeah. It's hard, harder to go back after, it's, after he's moved on to something else. But I don't want to do it at 25% completion. But if he's at 80%, I'll start trying to work with Andy on getting some documentation together. Yeah, I think it's ready that we could start documenting it. Um, but um, is Andy here on the on the call? No. Um, but. I think maybe ask him about it and I, I see if he thinks it's ready. I, th I think it's ready that we should have the, the initial documentation in there and um, just to get more people trying it out. Um, it does need a, a fair bit more testing and there are some corner cases that aren't handled at the moment. Um, we just need to, um, you know, try and get those corner cases fixed up and but I think documenting it now is worthwhile. If we get it documented and put a PR in, you don't have to be merged into the wiki and you could still put on discuss a link to the PR yep. to the wiki PR. We could. Um, and uh, yeah, so I think we could actually merge it into the wiki and just mark it as being that this is experimental and it's, it's not because um, we want diagrams and things and the diagrams will turn up better on the main wiki page than than just in the, the PR. Okay. Um, because we'll want, want sort of pictures of what they're looking for in the log analysis. Because part of it is you, you'll run it and then you'll want to do some log analysis to see the impact of it and show what frequencies it actually picked uh, to determine how well it's been doing. Yeah. Right. We've used the dev part of the wiki for that type of thing in the past rather than put it into the main vehicle wikis just to keep it a little bit separate for users. do a um, work in progress type thing like maybe um, have a page that is you know just here's the work in progress as far as like um, the, maybe this code is not in master yet but it's you know it's work in progress and so this this is not quite available or released but if you're testing PR or whatever just here's some resources to go to and then make it easy so that you we can just flip it over or change change file name or whatever and it just gets put into the main base that's probably the a deeper question, Tom, that links to having the wiki version controlled or release controlled with the firmwares and the way it's architected at the moment, you just can't do it. No, no, I don't mean to have it going in automatically with the PR. Uh, it can still be done manually, but I mean, as far as, you know, having a place to put it in, but right, because right now, anything that's on the wiki is basically live for everyone. And this, they assume it's like, fully featured and ready to go, unless we say work in progress or in there. And that, that usually gets forgotten to, to be removed or something. So I'm just thinking like if there is a, in the developer section, maybe we had a work in progress tab that that was purely just pages that we created that we can fill all the content out and we could, and um, people can kind of hack on that as we're working on it. And then that could be where the requirement is for pull requests where um, maybe that, that could be a tag or something we put on pull request, like need documentation and like it has to be in this width, in this width sort of thing or something. And then on merging it, we can just like rename the file or someone in the, on the wiki just like um, change the file name or something to slap it in the right directory or something like that. We should probably wrap up um, on the documentation one and, and, uh, uh, give a few minute break for a sort of toilet break and get a cup of tea and coffee before moving on to Peter's talk.